and welcome to this new lecture. In the previous lectures, we studied regarding the treatment strategies which are adopted for treatment of the uh, water or waste water which are getting generated uh, in the industry or in our residences and also depending upon whether the water has to be used for drinking purposes or further uh, use for treatment so that we can discharge it to some aqua system. So, in the previous uh, lecture we studied in detail there are various possibilities of uh, using the water treatment plant or different treatment units in combination so that we can achieve certain targets and what are those uh, targets could be? One of the target is that like getting the water for uh, drinking purpose and then further uh, and that water may be obtained from different sources. So, there is a possibility that the water that we want to use it for drinking that we are getting from the ground. So, that means we have a hard ground water which is coming. Also, there is a possibility in some other places that the ground water is not available and only raw water is being taken from a stream and that stream may also be very far away only via canal system water is being taken to that place and it is being further being used. And also if the surface water is there, so we have a stream which is very nearby and that water has to be treated. So, uh, this is these two possibilities are there. Similarly, water may be uh, taken from a lake or reservoir. So, there is also possibility of that. So, depending upon the requirement, the water treatment strategies may be different. So, this is illustrated here. There may be also a possibility that we want to treat the water which is getting discharged from municipal bodies or from the uh, industrial units. So, their treatment strategy will be also different. So, here we are trying to learn regarding the treatment steps for ground water and surface water. So, we see here for ground water actually uh, uh, what we are doing first is that we are aerating the water. So, this is being done because there is a possibility that ground water uh, if the water is coming from a confined aquifer it may still contain some amount of gases and if the gases are still not there it is possible that amount of oxygen and CO2 which is there it may be the, it may be either lower or higher value. So, that aeration is done so that to remove any toxic gas like H2S if present also to equilibrate the water with respect to the amount of oxygen and CO2 present in the water. So, this is possible also sometimes softening may or may not be required depending upon the presence of other ions uh, calcium, magnesium etcetera. So, for that we have do the softening process so that the hard water is softened further before use and also lot of residuals may be present. So, some other types of impurities may be present in the uh, ground water. So, those residuals have to be filtered and settled out there is a possibility that suppose arsenic is present in the ground water. So, under that condition arsenic also has to be removed. So, there is a possibility that we may include an adsorption step also. So, uh, so may anything may be used may not be used. So, depending upon the characteristic of the water uh, which is being taken for its designated use. Since we are going to use it for drinking. So, that means we have to perform disinfection so that we can remove maximum amount of pathogens before storing it and further distributing it in various residences for use. So, uh, that is why uh, this strategy is uh, common for water which is being taken from the ground water. Now, if the water is surface water and it is turbid which is highly possible during rainy season or any other season. So, if suppose rainy season water is there, so that means it will contain lot of sediments and those sediments have to be removed. So, what we do is that we will first screen the water so that we remove maximum amount of the suspended material 
out of that then some pre sedimentation and chlorination may be done so that we settle out most of the settleable solids and so that further treatment can be done still it will contain lot of dissolved solids so for removing the dissolved solids and remaining about of suspended solids which are not getting settled easily for that what we use that we use coagulation and flocculation methods so as to remove all these uh, maximum amount of dissolved solid and settleable solids and since we are using coagulation as a step we have to perform the sedimentation also so as to remove them and after that still it will contain uh, it may contain very small uh, size uh, pollutants and other materials so for that we use the filtration that may be sand filter we may use the carbon uh, adsorption technique also so that may or may not be there there is a possibility that we may have to if chlorination has not been done here we may require some chlorination or disinfection to be done here before actually distributing storing the water and further distributing the water to various aqueous uh, to various residences for further use so overall take away from this slide is that the the treatment units are same they may be used sometimes before sometimes after and that will depend upon the the amount of water is which is has to be treated then what are the various quantities and qualities of various pollutants which are present in that water so quantity is very important if load is high that the strategy may change quality is also very high suppose the water contains lot of carnaceous material so we may go for anaerobic treatment so that we can maximize the methane formation if it contains refractive materials or the materials which cannot be biodegraded so we may go for usual treatment using the primary treatment coagulation flocculation so that we can remove the solids beforehand because they have no further uh, uses as such in converting into any valuables and so any of the unit may be used beforehand may be used afterhand it will depend upon the characteristics of the water amount of water and also for the what is the designated use of the water further on so treatment strategies may be different now what we are going to do is that we are going to understand each and every unit operation with respect to water treatment in detail and one of the first and foremost unit operation that we are going to start today it is called flow equalization and flow equalization we are going to understand flow equalization in detail in today's lecture and then other units uh, will further be understood in detail their design and some of the basic design ideas also will be discussed so we'll start with the flow equalization so in many places the waste water which has to be treated in the treatment plant the amount of waste water generated actually varies in different season and also the amount or concentration of pollutants present in the water that also varies uh, along with the flow rate so that means Uh, we have variations in the flow rate in the concentration of pollutants and also the characteristics change during various seasons so and remember we always design a wastewater treatment plant with respect to some flow rate so uh, we require some flow rate based upon which that treatment plant is designed now along with the flow rate the concentration of pollutants in particular the lumped parameters like vod and cod are very important so always the treatment plants are designed based upon the flow rate and the pollution load and now if the that flow rate is not fixed and that pollution load is not fixed it is very difficult to operate the same plant at optimum condition so it becomes very challenging so and that challenge can be very well tackled by using a flow equalization tank or flow equalization unit 
So, a wastewater treatment plant which is already designed for some flow rate or some loading, it will never sustain large seasonal or other variation in the flow rates and then it will not work properly. It will efficiency will go down, the energy consumption values may become very high or they may change totally and in fact the plant may not work at all. If these flow rates and the pollution loads are not made equalized or they are not homogenized. So, for doing this we use a flow equalization basin. It actually overcomes the problems related to fluctuations in both flow rate as well as pollution load and uh, it flow equalization uh, controls the short term high volumes of incoming flow which is like uh, called as surges. So, suppose any wastewater treatment plant is working and suddenly a high flow rate is coming and the pollution load is also high. So, if we start taking all the water and that pollution load into our system, the system will totally collapse and it may not work properly after the this surge which is there that is gone also. So, it is highly possible that overall system may get totally damaged because of this. So, so, flow equalization can easily control this surge in the flow rate as well as pollution load that may happen suddenly. So, how does it helps in? So, it equalizes the flow rate and optimizing the time required for treatment in the secondary and tertiary treatment. So, since it actually equalizes the flow rate and pollution load. So, it works in a manner that all throughout the uh, time period during which the treatment plant is operational, uh, the amount of water going into the treatment plant and the pollution load, the amount of pollution load per unit volume. So, that remains constant. So, if that remains constant, the secondary and tertiary units will always they can work at optimum condition. So, it really helps in uh, optimizing the time required as well as the, uh, the treatment efficiencies are always high. So, it also helps in lowering the high strength wa water by diluting with the waste water already present in the equalization basin. So, in the equalization basin what is done is that, uh, that any condition if the water amount of water coming is beyond a certain value. So, what is done is that that water is taken from taken away from the main treatment uh, uh, units and it is stored at a place. And when actually the flow rate becomes low, then water is taken from that equalization basin and further combined with the water actually coming at those conditions and further use for treatment. So, it actually dilutes the high strength wastewater and thus it saves the secondary treatment unit in particular because the biological treatment units cannot work properly if the pollution load is too high because they are designed to a certain conditions of pollution load and flow rate. So, they can work very well. So, flow equalization basin is located after the primary treatment unit. So, generally it will be located after the primary treatment unit such as screening and git removal, but before the primary sedimentation. So, it is there. Basin volume, uh, what are the various things that we require for under designing the flow equalization? So, there are few things. What should be the basin volume and dimension? Okay. Uh, what are the different mixing and air requirements if any because it is possible that aeration unit may be combined with this unit itself. So, it is possible that we, we may require that what is the air requirement, uh, how much air requirement and how much mixing is there. So, there are certain ways through which we can understand this and this helps in designing the equalization basin. Not It is not very difficult thing to design. What are the various dis advantages and disadvantages uh, while using the flow equalization basin. So, there are certainly some advantages, those advantages are like it helps in improving the performance of uh, downstream secondary and treatment uh, tertiary units.
so it helps their performance and it does so because it reduces it uh, uh, homogenizes the flow rates as well as the pollution load and thus it reduces the operating and capital cost with respect to downstream processes otherwise if flow equalization basin is not there so we have to design the downstream uh, stages with respect to worst condition and that worst condition will be when there is a maximum flow rate or maximum pollution load. So, under that condition the operating and capital cost will be very high in particular the capital cost. So, by using the flow equalization basin we are designing the downstream processes at much lower design conditions in terms of and that reduces the capital cost uh, of the downstream processes. Also biological treatment is enhanced because it, it is now not under any shock load due to flow rate or pollution load. So, that all the biological units are working at the maximum efficiency is possible because of the flow equalization basin. Now, thickener and settler and other filter performance also get uh, enhanced and because some amount of settling and other things are possible also in the flow equalization basin. Now, what are the disadvantages? Certainly, additional land area will may be required. If there is no requirement of flow equalization basin, we do not require the uh, extra basin. So, that means the land area will not be required. Also, some additional capital and operating cost for this uh, flow equalization basin is required. So, this is additional cost. If, if it can be avoided, it is there, but it has lot of benefits. So, generally many people use flow equalization basin uh, during their design for treatment of any water or waste water and also uh, uh, the aeration units may be merged with the flow equalization basin. So, it is possible to do that. So, it actually helps overall in the treatment process. It has one issue that it may cause lot of order problems because it is coming before the treatment. So, if any odorous compounds etcetera are there in the water. So, that order will come out. So, it may cause problems to the nearby residential colonies and they may object to this overall treatment plant being created at that place. So, there is a possibility of order problem because of this. Now, there are two types of flow equalization systems possible. One is called inline equalization. So, what does it mean? So, in this case all the flow uh, passes through the equalization basin and helps in achieving the reduced fluctuations in the pollution concentration and flow rate. So, here what we see is that suppose there is some wastewater which is getting generated here and wastewater is coming here and uh, so the flow equalization basin all the water which is coming after grit removal some uh, pre treatment primary treatment it will pass through the flow equalization basin and from the flow equalization basin it will go to main treatment plant which may include a uh, primary secondary and tertiary. So, they it may include everything, uh, but now whole of the water is passing through this uh, equalization basin and then it is it is going for further treatment using the primary secondary and tertiary treatment which is there. So, this already we have discussed in detail. Uh, further we will be discussing. So, this is there. Then there is a second type of flow equalization basin which is called as offline equalization. So, in this case what happens that only overflow above a certain predetermined value is diverted into the basin. So, that means uh, here the water which is coming waste water which is coming it is passing through the screen grit removal. Now, if the flow rate suppose the optimum design is with respect to some flow rate and we assume the flow rate q optimum uh, which is based upon which design is there. Now, the q actual if the q actual is less than q optimum ok. So, under that condition the water will go directly. So, flow equalization basin I am just writing as f e b it will not be used not used only in this condition 
what is possible is that the water being taken in this case water will be water will be taken out from the basin itself. So, it is possible that some amount of water is being taken out from the basin and from the basin and uh, it is mixed with the Q. So, that we have a and mixed with Q actual. So, that we have the this this condition is reached, but if Q actual is larger than Q optimum. So, under that condition whatever is the overflow that will go into the flow equalization basin. So, this is what is meant here. So, only overflow above a predetermined value is diverted into the basin. It helps in reducing the pumping requirement because everything has not to be pumped through the flow equalization basin. Now, in this method of equalization variations in the loading rate can be reduced con considerably uh, because what is done is that if the Q value is Q under any condition if Q actual is more than Q optimum. So, under that condition we will be using the FEB. So, FEB will be used and over, uh, overflow rate will be going into the FEB. So, here FEB will be used. So, this is the flow equalization basin under that condition. So, offline equalization is more commonly used for the capture of the first plus from the combined collection systems etcetera. So, uh, the offline equalization has more advantage as compared to inline equalization basin and it is used more commonly as compared to inline. Inline always homogenizes everything. So, there is a possibility that it will it has more impact on the treatment units, but here uh, if the variations are too many we can use the offline uh, equalization basin only and this way it can work. Now, how to find out the volume of the flow equalization basin? So, uh, this is there and uh, this is what uh, what is the ma major design thing with respect to equalization basin that what is the volume that we require. Aeration and other things can be more understood when we will uh, we will understand the aeration basics and also the design aspects of aeration. So, from that we can understand regarding the air requirement etcetera, but here the basic purpose is to determine the volume of the flow equalization basin. So, this the first step is that we have to get lot of data. So, what is the wastewater generation data for a period? So, that period may be daily, that may be weekly, that may be monthly in which there is a significant variation in the wastewater generation volume or wastewater generation flow rates. So, both if variation is significant then that data is required. If we do not have the data we cannot go further. So, this type of data is required. So, what is the type of data? What we do is that we measure the time ok. So, in that time may be in hours or in days anything. So, it is possible and then we try to see that what is the flow rate that how much amount of water is generated in meter cube per day or any other unit on those days. So, that data is required and in between we can perform some averaging also. So, it is possible that if we suppose we start from the midnight suppose for we are collecting only data with respect to one day. So, we start from midnight and we have 100 meter cube per hour of the flow rate. So, per day of the flow rate which is there. So, this is this is being taken. So, similarly at after 2 o'clock 2 am 4 am 6 am so, this way we are collecting like then 12 noon, uh, 12 noon, then we have 2 pm, 4 pm, all these type of data may be 8 pm. So, we are collecting all the such data and 
we are collecting what is the flow rate which is there. So, 100 it may be possible it is 30, it may be 80, then 120. So, this type of data will be there. So, we first we have to collect all this data with respect to flow rate and time and this is the first step. Now, second step is to draw a cumulative volume versus time diagram and for the period in which all variations in the flow can be accounted for. So, we have to collect this data in such a manner that we can always account for all the variations in the flow rate. So, this is there and for so the second step is to draw a cumulative volume versus time data. So that means, here we are we have to collect like meter cube what is the volume of water which has been generated starting from first point and also with respect to time. So, this is like hours. So, we have to collect this data. Now, if we have to collect this data, so that means, if the flow rate is like per day or we can keep it for per hour suppose. So, we have 100 and we are 2 hours gap. So, that means, here till here we will have collected the volume will be like volume in meter cube. So, we are assuming that okay, this is this was 100 meter cube all throughout up till this point. So, 100 meter cube and 2 hours. So, that means, here we have collected till this time 200 meter cube. Now, in the next case we have 30 flow rate and 2 hour gap is there. So, that means, 30 into 2 plus 200. So, in the 200 we will add the 30 into 2 whatever is the average. So, it will become 260. So, and we will continue doing this. So, for the next case it will be 2 for the next case it will be 260 plus 80 into 2. So, this will be like uh, 160, 160 plus this. So, it will become 420. So, that means, what we are doing that we are trying to find out the cumulative volume which is there. Now, what we do is that we will we will draw the volume in cumulative volume, this is cumulative volume. So, this is we can write cumulative volume in place of volume. So, cumulative volume versus time. So, this way we can draw 2 hours, 4 hours, 6 hours like this and we can draw a graph like this. So, this this is the second step that we have to perform uh, draw a cumulative volume versus time diagram. Now, after that what we do is that there is a possibility that this type of curve may be obtained, then there is a possibility that this type of curve curvature may be obtained. So, in this case what we do is that, so whatever is the average flow rate, so this is the average flow rate, the data which is coming from here, so starting from 0 and here. So, if we draw the total total value and whatever is the total value, if we divide by 24 hours, it will give the average flow rate. So, actually this line, this line represents the average flow rate. So, also we can select any other flow rate also. So, that means, suppose we want to design for any other value. So, that means, we can always draw a line similar to that. So, meter cube per hour, so hour will take from here and we can decide for meter cube and we can draw a line like this. And in the third step what we do is that in this cumulative volume curve, we draw a line parallel to the average flow rate line. So, in this average flow rate line may be this one or any other design flow rate line also. And we draw a tangent to this, so we draw a this tangent line. So, this is a tangent line so, and in some cases we will be having two tangent line, this is upper tangent line okay, and this is the lower tangent line. So, uh, this possibility is there and uh, the next step is that we have to see the difference between this vertical difference. What is the volume with respect to average flow rate? and where this maximum value is coming with respect to this point and this point. So, we draw a tangent whatever is this point, here we draw a 
line parallel to the y axis. So, this y axis line will be drawn and the value of y axis. So, the volume of flow equalization basin volume of F A B is equal to the maximum uh, of A minus B we can write like this. So, absolute value of A minus B. So, here two lines are there. So, there are two possibilities it may be there. So, A minus B we can consider 1 and A minus B 2. So, whatever is the maximum of A minus B that gives the volume of F E B and which is the design data or the requirement for our purpose. So, through that uh, these steps we can find out the volume of the flow equalization basin and it gives the primary idea that how the treatment can be uh, what should be the volume dimensions etcetera can be decided based upon the whether we require CSTR type of unit plug flow. So, that is a different thing, but volume of basin can be obtained from here itself. So, this is it. So, now we have come to the end of flow equalization basin. We will start with other things in the next uh, unit. We will try to solve one question, maybe actual question and then further go on understanding other type of treatment unit. So, here you can see the required reaction volume or the uh, required uh, equalization basin volume is maximum of A minus B. So, this is there. So, thank you very much.